Hi guys, welcome back to my Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Another day, another great day for an interview. And today I've got Thomas Gersel with me. Uh, Thomas and I are co-authors on our new book, From Breakdown to Wake Up, and Jocelyn Bellows is the lead author, and it's, we are both dead excited because very soon this, this book is out and you guys can actually have it as a stocking filler, put under the tree, um, actually read some of it. Um, and, and we will talk in a moment when I say read some of it, uh, because it is the coolest book ever. But first things first, here we have got the evolving and enlightened Thomas Gersa. <laughs> Welcome to my show. Well, thank you, Stefan. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> I always ask my, uh, my guests before the show, hey, how would you describe yourself in two words? And mm -hmm. I had depression warriors. I had everything. And Thomas, Thomas was actually sort of saying evolving and, and, and lightened. And I had to reflect for a moment and I thought, Actually, you just described me in a nutshell there. And cool. it's so bizarre, isn't it? Isn't it, Thomas? I love it. I love it. Two likewise uh, people come together mm -hmm. by fate, yeah. karma, universe, whoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and here we are. So, uh, Thomas, thank you so much for coming on. How did you get involved with uh, Jocelyn? How did you get actually involved into that project? Well, Jocelyn and I had known each other for a few months, and she was a guest on my show, on my podcast, Decide to Transform, and she has a podcast as well, What's Your Leap? I was a guest, we traded guest appearances, and we, uh, we've, uh, that this was, I would say earlier this year, April or May, and I didn't get involved in the Breakdown to Wake Up project until the very, very last day before Jocelyn was to submit the list <laughs> to the publisher. It was, yeah, it, I, it hey, was no pressure. Hey, no pressure. By the way, Thomas, could you just do 5,000 5, words in, oh, you've got about 17 minutes. I like no, it. I like it. <laughs> well, happily, I didn't have to write the whole chapter in an afternoon. I just had to make the decision that, uh, that I was going to be involved. And, uh, you know, it was very interesting for me. A business partner is one of our co-authors, Lisa Berry. And uh, she and Jocelyn had gotten involved. Lisa is a part of this project. She's written a chapter. And, in fact, she and I have uh, helped a and Arlene Watts write a chapter for this for this book as well, which it was a tremendous transformational process for her. Yeah, absolutely amazing. But um, Lisa asked me if um, I was interested in joining her on this compilation, and I said yes. I've never done one before. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done a compilation and written a chapter with co-authors. So I've, I've really loved the experience. So it's been beautiful so far. Yeah. Isn't it? Because here we have got a book where 16 people who are mostly accomplished authors who have come together and share their story of transformation. And mm -hmm. uh, it's from breakdown to wake up. And it's yeah. uh, so breakdown means. Yeah, blood, sweat, tears, and actually gutter typically in one form of the other. And we all have gone to hell, but kept going. And that's the beautiful thing. So mm -hmm. guys, if this book is a fantastic, fantastic uh, storybook, where basically 16 people have this, have opened up their souls and to show their deepest inner <sighs> trials and tribulations that yeah. then led them to what they are now. Fantastic human beings who, who live their lives to the fullest because they've seen the darkness. So are you happy to talk a little bit about your darkness? Are you happy to talk a little let's, about let's your transformation? Let's talk as, as detailed as we want to be. <laughs> yeah, I'm game. Okay. <laughs> Tell us. Your, your, how was life before 2013 for you? Well, it was dark. It was not lightened, and it was uh, 
evolving, but it didn't seem like it was evolving at the time. And this was um, my chapter is called Reconditioning, and it's it's based on my story of having very toxic career life and a, a very toxic professional life that sapped all of my energy. So I was floating on um, a low grade kind of autopilot, just going through the motions and increasingly miserable, um, need to take an increasing amount of time away from my work and just find self spiraling down. That was pre-2013, well, and during 2013. Hmm. And when you say spiraling down, that normally indicates a slow, uh, insidious uh, worsening. And mm -hmm. it is that, I mean, if once you crash into a wall, uh, then bang, you know, okay, enough is enough. But it's that slow and insidious that every day sucks the, the, the life out of you. That is so mm -hmm. hard, isn't it? Yep. Yes. And that was the case for me. So for, for those, uh, those listening here, the, the career itself was mediation. So alternative dispute resolution as an alternative to going through the court system. And um, in the United States, where I, at the time in the state of Oregon, um, there is required mediation for people in family and custody disputes. So that was the, that was the high stakes conversation that I had five to six, seven, sometimes eight times a day with grieving parents and clients that were not at their best, despite being really good people out the situation. It's a divorce, it's a separation, it's a situation that doesn't bring out the best in anybody. And I had, well, willingly and then unwittingly both done this for 13 years. So I was eshing myself in this high-level conflict professionally. The pay was very good. Uh, so yeah, that, that I think that kept me in, but it was toxicity that just built up and built up and built up. And I began to really want, yearn for a way out, yet was unable to actually do it for a number of reasons, not just the money, not just the constant referral stream, all of that. I mean, those are all great from a business standpoint, and they were wonderful when I started, but not so toward the end. And this was about a 13-year period of my life. Out of interest, did you have counseling yourself in the sense of a mandatory coach or a mandatory, um, was there a system in place to look after yeah. yourself? No, <laughs> no, not after ourselves. And uh, it's very, very interesting because a couple of my colleagues had been doing the exact same thing for 30 plus years that were very good at, at what they did. And, and uh, you know, I'm thinking of a woman that was my business partner at the time who had been doing this for 35 years and excelled at it and, and loved it. And there was no built-in system for self-care. We just showed up and we conducted all of these sessions and um, just kind of went for it. And I, I know that very well. I was, a, I was a private pain physician here in New Zealand and I built up a, a huge practice and okay. I worked around the clock and like you, I saw people at their worst, at their greatest suffering. And I think I was quite good in what I was doing because I had this empathy and uh, I wanted to help them. That was my main mm. driving force. Yeah. The problem, of course, is that there was quite a bit of transference, that there was a lot of me taking on the problems mm. of them and letting their stress and distress wash over me and taint me, so to speak. So therefore, I have to cleanse myself every evening with alcohol to actually uh, get rid of that, that emotional, uh, dirty luggage, dirty baggage uh, that, that is there. And it was, it, with hindsight, 
I don't think that any of such jobs like a pain physician and probably like a mediator, uh, things like that, should really be a solo job. Uh, but there, there should be some supervision, like with psychologists <laughs> and with things like that. But that's, yes. that's beautiful to say in hindsight. And it's beautiful to say in the private setting. Because in the right. private setting, you have to pay for that relationship. You have to, to you know, it is, uh, it's a tricky one, isn't it? But yes. I certainly fell foul of not having someone where I could run things past. And you sound a little bit like that too. Right. I, I did. And, uh, and my, my wife, uh, then girlfriend at the time, had to actually listen to me process all of this. So uh, I've, I've apologized to her many times. <laughs> but uh, there were days where it was just really, really dark. And I got into it for the same reason as you got into your practice to help people. And I love problem solving. This is one of the things that I really, really love about work in general, life in general, is seeing things from multiple different dimensions, multiple different ways. And there are dozens of ways to work through any situation. I love showing that to people and, and doing it myself. So it was a natural entree, but it was also time to leave in 2013. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it was over, <laughs> for sure. But, okay, so how did that transformation happen? What was the catalyst? Because you didn't choose one day, oh, today I will leave, is it? No, no, I wanted to. I, I wanted to, but that did not work because I drafted several different versions of a resignation letter. So the way my contracts worked were with individual um, individual counties, so a local government entity that would uh, then send people through their own court system um, uh, to me as a private contractor. So I drafted a, a number of different iterations of these and never sent them. I would draft it like people will do. You know, you'll draft an email or a letter or something to compose your thoughts and save it. And so I, I did that. <laughs> yeah, for months, in fact. <laughs> right, there you go. It's yeah. interesting. So deep in your soul, you knew change had to um, come. So oh, yeah. what, what pushed you? What pushed me was on December 3rd, 2013, I, um, it was a Tuesday, I remember very, very well. I got up uh, to go to a job in another town in a neighboring county, about an hour drive away. And it was something that I'd done, well, literally hundreds or maybe even a thousand times, uh, the same drive, uh, same same set of, of clients in the same location. And, um, you know, the people themselves individually were different. It was just the same situation. And on along the way, I got into a major car accident where I was, uh, I was struck, I was uh, T-boned right broadside at uh, 60 miles per hour. That was how fast they estimate the, the vehicle was traveling. So 100 kilometers an hour, roughly. Ouch. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember any of it. What I remember was waking up in the hospital instead. What were you driving? I was driving a Honda Civic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little yeah. ashtray ash on wheels. Okay. <laughs> I, the, love, I love Honda Civics. I, <laughs> I, I do too. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah. they're nice little cars, but there is not much yes. buffer there. So, no. And being T-boned with 100 Ks per hour. That normally mm -hmm. is such a force. Uh, wow. It's a lot. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. How did you end up? Well, I wound up, um, I, I woke up in the hospital with a, um, a ticket as a, a citation on my lap because apparently it was my, <laughs> apparently. It was my fault. So uh, who's to, yeah, so, you know, somebody says, okay, this guy pulled right out in front of me, which apparently I did, but I don't remember. So as I was struggling for breath, uh, that's when the police arrived. So, uh, you know, I went, I went ahead and paid the ticket, but that was, uh, that's a classic, let's add some insult to this massive injury. Uh, so I woke up with that, with tubes sticking all over me and in, in massive pain. And I was in, I was in the ICU. Um, 
And uh, they, they informed me that I had been in a car accident and my hip bone was completely shattered. My left hip, which was the other uh, side, it was, they, you know, I was struck on the driver's side. Yeah. And uh, it, my hip was just, well, not the joint, the joint was fine, but the bone around it, the acetabulum, yeah. was absolutely fractured and shattered. And I had to stay in that same ICU for three days before I was stable enough to even be transported for surgery. And, and those were some um, long, dark hours for sure. Yeah. For those of you out there, I mean, the acetabulum is this where the, the leg bone uh, connects mm -hmm. with the hip itself. And that's quite a crucial part. So basically, uh, every single movement of your leg, you want to stretch your leg, that mm -hmm. will hurt like stink. More importantly, on the inside yes. of your pelvis are a lot of blood vessels. Uh, right. It's uh, not a pretty place to have a fracture because the smallest kind of movement also might disrupt these blood vessels. And guess what? You're going to die. You're going to bleed heavily. So this is not for the faint-hearted. Don't try that at home, kids. Um, so, Thomas, yes. you had not a great time there. Um, but normally with such force, it's not just the pelvis. Um, <laughs> did you have a head injury? I mean, you woke no. up in the in the ICU and you can't recall much. So you had a bang on the head at least there. So it was, there was a mild head injury uh, that was given with that. Uh, but sure. ot otherwise the rest of you, the, 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 how was your spine? How was your, your insides? Just fine. There was no other damage, wow. just that. I mean, you, I mean, there was not just one guardian angel, okay? You no. had a triplet of guardian angels sort of <laughs> guiding you there. This is beautiful. I mean, first of all, <laughs> wow, that you're here. Great. Yes. Great. But, yes. But it didn't look like it for, to you. No. Afterwards. No. Yeah, it's not the kind of experience that uh, one uh, envisions <laughs> at all. And I had never actually broken a bone at all. I, I played American football for five years and never broke a single bone. And a uh, you know, violent game, um, high speed, high, high collision, and uh, yeah, never broke anything. Uh, th that was my first experience. And when they finally did transport me for the surgery, it was a six and a half hour major orthopedic procedure. And I, I think that they gave me eight units of blood, maybe nine, quite a lot. Um, quite a lot, and uh, it was um, it was very very uh, intense. I, I spent a couple of weeks in the hospital learning uh, to actually to walk again, which took that was the process. It took about three months to actually gain the mobility back. Yeah, very very difficult. <laughs> And these are, these are dark times because here you were, a man who was always in control. Mm -hmm. You were in control of your situation. You were in control of your business. You were in control of everything. And now guess what? We're going to strip it all of you. And we put you into a morning gown that doesn't fit. And your bits <laughs> are hanging out. Your, yes. your sanity is left on the front entrance together with your dignity. Uh, mm -hmm. And... <laughs> wow, this is this is a brutal, brutal uh, breakdown, literally, uh, right. for you. It was. How it, it, it was. How did you deal with that? What were your? What was your? Well, initial, initial response. How did your body, your brain, try to cope? Well, I was on such heavy pain medication for <laughs> some time that uh, I would come, I, I would float for days in and out of consciousness. I would drift in, I would drift out. I remember at one point after the surgery, they, they installed um, an IV with morphine and I had one of the buttons that, that you can press if you're in extraordinary pain, but it wouldn't let you keep going like this. It wouldn't let you continue to press and hold the thing down. But uh, I had those, I had that for a little while for what I imagined to be probably two or three days. And then once they took me off that, that was the ultimate hell. That actually, for me, was worse than 
being injured, being um, shattered itself, because the the cold sweats would last all night, and um, it was a that that was a short, oh. awful process. And um, yeah, it, it was short. It was awful, and I still couldn't walk. So I would drift in and out of consciousness, and um, you know, I just thought I would. What really helped me. Um, was the fact that I've had a meditation practice for about 35 years. I, I started actively meditating in high school in the 1980s. And it's just, I mean, literally, quite literally, life is one breath at a time. So I, I would literally come back to that so my mind didn't wander off into, oh my God, well, I'm, I'm really injured. Why is this happening to me? Um, why was I the victim of this circumstance? Which in fact, I recognized at the time, as hard as it was, was really quite a gift. And it was really quite a gift because it enabled me to quit the toxic career. All of my clients were transferred to my colleagues because I couldn't didn't well serve people from the hospital on pain medication. So it was a clean slate. And I, I knew that in my heart. However, it was very, uh, very important that I, I keep above the pity party going on in my own head, because it was certainly, certainly there. Interesting. How early did you get that, that appreciation that there might be a silver lining to that very dark cloud? It probably took me about a week to 10 days of, of, of being in the hospital. Um, and uh, it was after I began to feel a little bit better emotionally, at least. Physically, I was still immobile and in quite a bit of pain. But um, emotionally, uh, it was much better because uh, my, my kids came to see me. Friends would come to see me. And um, my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, brought me Thai food and pizza. And a good friend of mine brought me vanilla ice cream. So it was, it was really quite, uh, that, that part was fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to you have to make the best of oh, of, hell a, yes. of a situation. Hell yes. <laughs> yeah, I oh, know that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And uh, it it took me much longer to see the benefits. And in my case, there was quite a bit of a grieving grieving process there with regards to my old life because mm -hmm. I literally that was the only thing I knew. There was okay. I was I had identified myself with that life as if you had asked me, well, who are you? Well, I'm a pain physician. I am running, mm -hmm. you know? That, yeah. And you, you think, wow, okay. And then once that was stripped back and was gone, I was quite empty. I was quite hollow, and I did not know what my future would be. I mean, I, I was an anesthetist and I had been working throughout that my pain practice also as, a, as an anesthetist, uh, helping people through surgery. And that then became my main uh, work. Mm -hmm. And I must say, this is, uh, this is something I was good in and I love to do. So I was, there was that, that thing to fall back on. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. But it took, as I said, it was a, quite a distinct grieving process for probably oh, six months yeah. at least. Sure. So um, was there a grief mm -hmm. there or what, were you actually so happy, hey, it's gone uh, and yes, it hurts, <laughs> but uh, it's well, gone? Well, it was quite mixed, in fact, and, and it would depend on not just the day, but the moment of the day. One minute I would feel fantastic that I was relieved of this <laughs> burden that I, I couldn't bring myself to do the old-fashioned way by mailing a letter to somebody. <laughs> Sending an email, clicking and That's hitting right. send. I mean, how hard can that be? Well, <laughs> it was it was quite difficult. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah, and uh, I I, I would alternate from feeling really really good and and, and even yeah grateful. Um, it, it's not uh, it's not an exaggeration to be rid of that much stress. But I also would immediately jump out of the present moment and ahead to the future of how am I going to make money. Mm -hmm. Identity. 
because it had been, as it is for a lot of people. As you just mentioned, you know, we, we identify ourselves with our career choice. I was a mediator. Hmm. And exactly. now, what exactly am I? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it is uh, it is exhilarating and scary and yes. and I was yeah as as you say there's this roller coaster literally of very rapid cycling between I can do that and hey I've got all these opportunities to oh my god my life ends now and mm -hmm. and both things are true. Uh, both both attitudes are true, uh, mm -hmm. so it's a matter of of the the devil and the angel on your shoulder, and you have to decide who you want to listen to, and right. that is that is the hard thing. Um, it, it was <laughs> okay. Yes. So we're learning to walk. It's a a very painful thing and a very frustrating mm -hmm. thing. Here you were an athlete for five years uh, in in defining right. yourself as a young man in football and. Right. Football is a is a macho. Is a is a is a hey. Uh, you, you you slap yourself on the on the chest. There is the yes. the silverback gorilla in you uh, mm -hmm. that that uh, you let out on the on the field, and that's right. cool. So and now that silverback gorilla says, "Ah, oh, well, actually, I need to take one step, and that bloody well hurts, and I can't even do that right." How did oh, that go? Yeah. That right? and it, it, it's, it gives me a, a tremendous appreciation for how, how fortunate we are all of the time. And, and uh, when you're injured like that, it, I actually remember very acutely remember having to plan every action. A walk to the refrigerator was, okay, I'm going to put my right hand on the counter. <laughs> then I'm going to move my left foot forward. <laughs> then I'm going to move my right hand again and balance myself. And I have literally had to think through all of that. Opening the refrigerator took a tremendous amount of brain power. And these are things that we do every day without thinking about it. All of a sudden, it's a major project. And that's therefore it's so good for me as a doctor from now and then to actually also be on the receiving end, uh, to actually get humbled like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Little accidents mm -hmm. where suddenly your medial meniscus in your knee uh, plays up due to a twisting injury and you actually experience nasty knee pain for six weeks, two months, etc. And you, you you hobble around like like a much older man. And right. it's very, very humbling. And mm -hmm. you yes. say you, you do no longer take things for granted. And I know. It's, that's so beautiful, isn't it? The gratitude yes. that comes out of that journey. The gratitude for things that everyone else takes for granted. And uh, right. Does right. gratitude play uh, play a role in you? Is that part of yes. your meditation? It is. It, it's it's quite huge. And uh, for a couple of years now, I've um, I've been adding that to my journal entries. I, I've been a writer in one form or another for most of my life, and uh, it, this is something that I add to it. It plays a role in my meditation, and it's very easy to just come up now with things to be grateful for. And uh, I remember at the time, as I was beginning to work that into my meditation practice around that time, it was something I actually had to consciously think of to a greater degree, but it, it has become automatic. Mm. Now, the, the calming aspect of the meditation was how I started and, and how I went forward for 20 years or so. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. And it's something that is so weird. I do it uh, often enough and I'm, I'm a little bit bewildered and, and befuddled and, and, and everything hits me from all sides. Um, typically in the morning when I sort of think of the day and I see immediately 20 challenges and 30 things to do and everything has a time timeline and then you think, oh, sure. And then mm -hmm. I find myself automatically, um, for a moment, just a fraction of a second, stop. Okay, what are you grateful for? I am happy and grateful. So that's how I start every sentence. I'm happy and grateful that. 
And then whatever comes in my mind, and it's amazing what your mind suddenly comes up with. The little things yes. that you actually thought, oh, where's that coming from? And it, it shows the different side of your brain that actually recognizes, yes, there are all these challenges, often self-inflicted mm -hmm. challenges. Uh, but, but it comes up with beautiful, beautiful things. So journaling right. has been, journaling and writing it was one of the outlets. Did, yes. you, did you keep a diary in the hospital out of interest? I, I I did not. I didn't have access to oh, that. Right. Um, but uh, I, I have uh, when I was no, not um, I'm well under the influence of extraordinary pain medication. I, I remember a great deal, and I remember most of the conversations that I had with people that came to visit me or or that mm. called on the phone. And I was very grateful for that. Uh, it was very touching to me to know that this. Um, this injury that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the one sitting there in the hospital bed, but it impacted so many people's lives mm. and uh, more than I could imagine. So I, I was very grateful for that. And, uh, you know, I knew that uh, that was, that was something that I would have to, uh, to, to place my mind on, I think is the, is the best way to describe it when the victim mentality came up, <laughs> when that little voice said, no, no, you're injured, poor you. <laughs> yeah. was, was there a poor me, poor me, poor me, another one? Um, did, did alcohol or, or, or other means of, of numbing the pain come in? You, you're saying the, you mentioned the appropriate use of pain medications, uh, which has a a beautiful calming side effect, anxiolysis, right. uh, all these kind of things. I mean, there is mm -hmm. there is there is a very positive aspect to pain medications right. sure. in that of setting. Course. Um, were there other temptations there? In your mind? No, no, uh, I, I'm very fortunate. So I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that too, because I know that's not the case for many people, but I wanted to get off of that as quickly as I could. Um, I, I couldn't stand the idea of needing it and, and needing to be on it. And of yeah. course, there are side effects, uh, physical side effects with being on that kind of medication that uh, yeah, make life less pleasant. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I needed it for some some number of weeks, but I, I really wanted to get off of that as quickly as, as I possibly could. And, uh, you know, really the, the real addiction for me was a psychological addiction to my own drama that led up to the auto accident, to that sense of, um, the despair that led up to the frustration that led up to it. I mean, that was something I can easily look at. And I thought, okay, well, I spent the better part of my adult life up until this point, really taking myself down. It's a, it's a very similar journey. And I thought, okay, when I was, when I was approached to write a chapter in this book, I thought, okay, well, this is great. What a, a, what a great opportunity to go deep on that road. And because, you know, breakdown, well, it certainly was. <laughs> it was a breakdown, <laughs> a big breakdown. Yeah. Was it cathartic for you to write that? Uh, yes. To... Yes. Surprisingly so. I, I knew that it would be to some extent, but the extent to which it was cathartic really surprised me. I processed a great deal um, and in a, a very short period of time because, as, as we mentioned, I was very late to the party on this one, so to speak. So I didn't have a lot of time to get everything done, get everything in, uh, get our, our clients' work in, and then help with that component. It was all very pressure cooker in terms of time, but I think it really helped me to focus. And I went very deep. It was a great experience. Dito, same here. I mm. actually, like you, I came quite late to the party uh, as well. Uh, are you interested? Yes. And I said, oh, we've got a month for you to get that chapter in. 
And I said, what do you mean a month? No, 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 no. Your time frame doesn't work. So I convinced Jocelyn, no, you need to have it really in, in two weeks because with your schedule already of publication, you need to make sure the first drafts are getting in. So I actually cut myself from from a month of writing to two weeks of writing. <laughs> and I actually ended no. up uh, in those two weeks hammering it out. Uh -huh. And it was, therefore, such an intense journey. And it was amazing what my subconscious and my fingers wrote. And then I read what I wrote and I thought, oh, Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's amazing because that it's like with journaling, uh, the, the offering, the writing, suddenly things are in words, in words that you have chosen and you have chosen for a reason. And so there is always, I find, I find always that there are new revelations, new insights, new aspects, new, new facets of, of it that I had either forgotten or had not appreciated in there. Uh, severity or in their in their impact on me yeah isn't it yeah yes it's, and i guess yes. for you guys out there i mean i mean learn from us because here we are we're essentially we have gone through trauma we have gone through through massive change massive transformation i mean yeah. to the to the deepest the deepest core of us uh everything mm -hmm. that we, we believed in we Turn, changed, hacked away, put new things on, but mm -hmm. now down the line, would I have it any other way? No, no. The only regret I've got is why did I wait this long <laughs> for, <laughs> for that change to happen? Honestly, <laughs> right. right. Well, I think we can all look back and think, oh, well, I could have done this uh, a, dec a decade sooner, maybe, <laughs> perhaps, but yeah, it didn't, wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> no, exactly. And that's yeah. the reason that you are now who you are, a man yes. who lives life to the fullest, a man mm -hmm. who is out there to, to, to change lives. Tell us a bit about your life right now, because oh, you, yes. have, you have made a new new way of life your own uh, tell us a bit about yes that. oh it, it's it's really quite wonderful that's why when when you asked me earlier the two words I, I landed after i thought about it for a couple of seconds and i landed on lightened and and then evolving. And that's really what it is. I mean, right now, um, after I published my, my very first book last year, I got involved in the podcasting arena, which now is the centerpiece of, of my whole professional life, which, which is really quite wonderful. I'm a show host, and together with our co-author, Lisa, we are podcast and media producers, and we have a, a business in helping people produce podcast series, uh, books for a chapter in a compilation, media. It's all media focused, and it's all focused on personal growth and transformation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just a joy for me to be able to give people the space to have those breakthroughs. So it's really quite wonderful. I never would have imagined Honestly, even a year ago, I never would have imagined that I'd be in this place right now. I did not see it coming, <laughs> which makes it even more beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. Tomas, you're, you're my 114th interview, and uh -huh. this, which means I had an hour with 114 beautiful people mm -hmm. that I would have not come across in, uh, in, in another way. And yes, who have changed me, opened my eyes, humbled me by sharing their own often traumatic and dramatic uh, stories. Mm -hmm. It is such a beautiful journey, uh, probably yes. a little bit addictive in its own right, but I guess <laughs> in a good way, because good I'm way. nowadays addicted to get my shit together. And mm. every single discussion with, with people like you r shows me how you have taken on challenges and have succeeded. Mm -hmm. What skills did you bring 
to the party to start off with what worked well, much of it probably didn't work and then um yeah <laughs> no. you 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 are left with with okay a, a core of you and then you build around that core and build up this this beautiful beautiful being and that is the great great thing so yeah. guys for you out there if if people like Thomas and me can get their shit together I think there's a damn good chance that you guys out there can do the same. This is this is your life. Don't let someone else write the end of your book. This is yes, you have done some chapters that you might not be so right. proud of and, and that are a bit dark. You know, yeah. that's that's the trials and tribulations. Every every free act story, the hero has to go through some very dark times. Right. But then in every good film, in every good book, the hero needs to make that choice. Is it time to change? And he often enough doesn't want to make that choice. Then something pushes him, in your case, the... the the, the accident in my yes. case the absolute burnout and the alcohol which finally came to, to a crushing hold and mm. it is it is that that uh, catalyst that the moment in time when it's absolutely necessary to change and then <laughs> it's yes. then the fun starts in the film then the hero goes on a journey and then he beats his own uh, not so nice self and becomes out the, the heroine, the hero at the other end. That's yes. why you guys go to the pictures. That's why you read books. Mm -hmm. Well, how about becoming the hero in your own journey? Mm -hmm. How about, I put it to you guys, how about going out there and actually trying to figure out what holds you back and trying to figure out what is the, the real, the pain in you, in your soul. And is where is the point where you just even scratch on the surface and it hurts as hell. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that's your transformation waiting. That's, that's where yeah. you guys can go out there and, and, and make this world a better place by working on yourself by you know yeah. living alive and i mean that's what you do now so you're right now you're changing things you i mean thomas you you have written a book tell us about yes. your book so oh. because the, there is there is the chance here to 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 learn from thomas and and mm -hmm. you say oh, wow i wonder how he did it well guess what he's written a book <laughs> yeah. i have I have written it, and for those of you watching on video, I'm going to prove this to you hey. right now. <laughs> there is the book, the book, the the only one that I've published up yeah. up until now with yeah. Breakdown to Wake Up, and this one is is all me. It's yeah. called Decide. That's the title. It, it was it was the result of teaching meditation. So in 2018. I had a, an experience that can best be described as an aha moment. It was a divine nudge because after years and years of practicing meditation uh, by myself, I've, this is one of the things that I just have always loved is I would go off in a corner or go off to the woods or drive out to the desert and just sit. And it was, I yeah, have beautiful experiences, all kinds of things. And I finally got the, the, the call, the order, I think the divine order to begin sharing this. This was two years ago in 2018. And I began teaching meditation and that has exponentially changed everything in the last two years. It's been high speed, high speed transformation. But this book, Decide, is based on people's limiting stories that I would hear as a meditation instructor all the time of, oh, I can't do that, right? Oh, I don't have time. Mm. <laughs> yeah, good one, good one. I, I don't have time. Right? And I just came, went through all of them. I realized, okay, this is a book that is in the making, and I have to write it. I haven't seen anything specifically 
like this. So I'm going to write that. And that led to podcasting. And, and here we are a couple of years later. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. Because it is really, decide is a very, very good, good uh, keyword there. Because you need to, to consciously make a choice. Because mm -hmm. that choice then leads into action. You yes. can listen to every self-help book that is out there, to every Tony Robbins CD that you can get mm. your fingers mm -hmm. on, and you listen to it, and you listen to it, and you listen a bit more. That's my life. I, for, for many years, I was interested in self-improvement. And yes, I listened to Tony Robbins. I thought, oh, that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, really. And I did bugger all. Nothing. I did well. You know, I made lists, huge to-do <laughs> yes, lists. Yes. And lists. but my uh -huh. to-do lists were so huge that I set myself up to fail by just writing them because no human being, no Hercules, could possibly do everything that I had on my to-do list to be done on that day. So therefore, I programmed myself to fail every single day. So rubbish like that. So did I take action? No. I needed to learn to take action. But in order to do so, you need to have the recognition that yes. you're at a moment in time where you need to decide to do mm -hmm. something. Yeah, it is, you, you need to make the decision to say, yes. no, whatever worked so far, uh, well, <laughs> whatever didn't work so far uh, has been that. And now I decide to try something new and then mm -hmm. evaluate how that new suits my new right me my new direction yeah that is what your book is about so it's beautiful literally beautiful. That's uh, right. thank you yeah so guys go out there get thomas's book and and actually learn about decide <laughs> that's right uh, yeah. then thereafter you get yourself another book which is my steps to sobriety mm -hmm. because in there um you find the next step the action plans, because what I've put into my steps of sobriety are those things that helped me to actually get my shit together. Now, in my case, it was alcohol, my main thing, but addiction in its own right comes in so many shapes and colors from, from sex addiction to gambling, to the, to the social media, yeah. to all those kind of things, sugar. Um, so there is so much out there. And ultimately, whilst this is about sobriety, sobriety should be defined as living a life so beautiful that alcohol and drugs simply have no, no room in it because you're yeah. so busy living this fantastic life. And I've put shitloads of off action plans in there. So, oh, so guys, check it out. And, and, and between those three books, Decide, My Steps to Sobriety, and now From Breakdown to Wake Up, mm -hmm. you have got such beautiful mixtures of, we come from different angles at, at this, this task of living a beautiful life. And it is, it is a wonderful, wonderful journey yeah. that we all have yeah. gone on. Uh, mm -hmm. we, most of us didn't choose to go onto this journey, but here we are and we wouldn't have had it any other way. No. And that is again and yeah. again and again, the yeah. same thing I hear from my guests. You bet. So, uh, Thomas, it was, it was brilliant to catch up with you today, uh, because it is, you shared, thank you so much for sharing so much of your, your personal, personal insights and personal history, which for sure was Oh dear, what a story, that's all I can say, because it's such a deep transformation. Yeah, but looking in your eyes now and, and hearing your passion, wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so much, it's been my pleasure. And it, I, I really enjoy, I, thank you so much for the opportunity to come on and share with all Absolutely. of you listeners today. I really appreciate this. Before we go, if people want to get hold of you, if people want to work with you because you're doing some coaching and you're, you're doing a lot of uh, active things out there, how can they find out more yes, about okay. you? Yeah, thank you. I mean, people are more than welcome to reach out to me via my own uh, website, which is Tomas Garza, T-O-M-A-S-G-A-R-Z-A dot -A com. Email is a great way, and that's Tomas. T-O-M-A-S at 
tomasgarza.com. Facebook Messenger is a beautiful way as well to reach me, and you can find me there. That's where I do a lot of my work. In fact, it's it's the modern office, so I'm always there, and that's <laughs> Tomas Garza on Facebook. Uh, feel free to send me a message, um, an email, the website, tomasgarza.com. Oh, Thomas, thank you very much. So guys, you've got it all there. If you didn't get it all, just look into the description of the video or of the podcast. All the information sure. will be in there. But uh, guys, don't, don't accept where you are right now as a given. The reason that you have listened to this podcast or to this video today means that you are on a, on a journey. And some of you might might not know it yet that you are but you are and mm -hmm. hopefully thomas and i have have planted that seed have planted that that vision that feeling of hope which is sometimes so important because when you're in a dark place you don't see it that there could be a way out Right. And we are living proofs. We are living mm -hmm. proofs, okay, mm -hmm. that there is hope out there. Two numbnuts who who thought they knew it all and then oh, the universe nice. had to, to kick us up the proverbial to actually make us realize what is important in life. And <laughs> oh, yeah. nowadays we do. So, guys, if we can do it, you yeah. can do it. Absolutely. Cool. Thomas, again, thank you so much. And you guys out there, look after yourself. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>